the next module is on major types of filters in the context of brain-computer interfaces. And the first and simplest one are so-called static filters. We discussed that. And some examples are uh, just squaring the signal. So here's a concrete example. The transformation rule is defined as the ith channel of the output signal at sample n is the ith channel of the input signal at sample n squared. Very simple. So you just square this. That's um, actually quite practical uh, as, as a vehicle um, to calculate things like the variance of the signal and things like that. You can have another one, say logarithm. So this is what these things in practice look like. And um, the next more complicated one are what we call spatial filters. That's filters that, as I said, operate across space and they don't operate, operate across time. So formally, they take a multi-channel signal X, uh, I am now using capital letters to denote multi-channel signals, and um, the output Y at that time point depends only on X and so they're static. And most of them are linear. So that means you can basically write it as a linear map. So the, the nth sample is a matrix M times that sample, um, and that gives you the output, basically. So you can say this is a matrix that, that um, takes, you know, that transforms a multi-channel sample into a multi-channel output sample. You could say the rows of this matrix are, um, are spatial, individual spatial filters. So uh, it's a linear combination of channels. I'll show you a few pictures on that. And um, there is one reason why these are so important in BCIs, and that is that uh, the, the volume conduction in the brain that I talked about in the, in the second lecture is a linear mapping. So um, the, the mapping from a source to, a sens to all the sensors is linear. And so you can approximately invert it and go back from, from sensor observation to source observations also with a linear map namely with the inverse of that map, uh, under some extra assumptions, uh, you know, such as that there's no more sources than you had sensors and stuff like that. So, and that's why um, these are very practical in BCIs, because you don't really want to s operate at the level of sensor signals, right? Uh, we, we've discussed that. You want, to, um, you want to operate on the actual source processes, because it's higher fidelity, or it's actually where the action, in fact, happens. And there's lots of examples of of these kinds of spatial filters, re-referencing is one. You subtract, the, say, the, um, the value of a reference channel from all others, or you subtract the average of all channels from each channel. Surface Laplacian is another one. Um, that's basically from a channel, subtract all neighbors. Uh, and if you do that, you, you, know, you get better signal-to-noise ratio and so on. You have more focal. Um, uh, um, sort of a more focal um, gain uh, in, in brain space and so on. I'll say a few things about that. Uh, there's also a few others. After you have calculated um, an independent component analysis or so, after you've calculated this matrix in some way, you can usually apply the, that matrix just as a linear spatial filter um, online or so. Uh, another one, uh, an important algorithm, common spatial patterns, is another way to design this matrix. So there are many ways to come up with that kind of matrix. You can design it by hand, you can optimize it, and so on. And I'll give you a little bit of an intuition. So for this matrix M, here are some of the rows plotted, um, six rows times whatever, however many channels you had. I think it's 32. These are, each of them is a spatial filter. So you can view it as a linear combination of channels. Um, if you apply this linear combination to a multi-channel sample, it gives you one output sample. All right, it's just you know, this channel times something negative, blue is negative, this channel times something positive, red is positive, and the others times something is close to zero, green is zero. Um, and add it, add it up in that way, you get a new sample, and if you do it for every sample, you get a new time series. These things are optimized to pick up motor cortex activity. Motor cortex, as we said, is this strip of brain tissue which is sort of about here, and it's primarily consisting of things that are connected to motor inputs and output, what, I mean primarily motor output, nerves. So uh, you see all of these are sort of around that central uh, strip. Um, but you can't really see 
it's very hard to decide what exactly they pick up. And so uh, what we would be interested in perhaps is some interpretation of that. And so if you say these are some rows of a matrix W um, that you multiply by the sensor signal to get some approximation of a source signal, um, you can calculate the inverse of that matrix if it's full rank, um, if it's invertible, basically. And if you now plot, um, uh, you know, the, um, the individual projections, you basically get how each channel in S, it's now columns, maps onto the sensors. So um, you see that um, the, the source signal that's picked up by this filter actually projects not um, sort of negative here and positive there, somewhat surprisingly, <laughs> but it's actually sort of um, angled in a way. So all of these are actually tangential brain sources. They are, you can, uh, as we said, they are s compatible with the projection of a single dipole that sits somewhere in the brain, and they are probably in a sulcus. Um, so uh, maybe the central sulcus is here. Um, this one is more of a, of a radial projection, so that means it's, it might be angled like you know, this or so. So um, that's an important difference. Whenever you see something that looks like that, you know oh, that's probably a spatial filter. And whenever you see something that resembles, say, a dipole or some of those, it's probably a forward projection. Um, and the two are related by, in, in, by the inverse, basically. So, um, and the next category of filters is, is in a sense, orthogonal to that conceptually. Uh, that's what we call temporal filters. They take a multi-channel signal X, and they're defined such that each channel, the ith channel of the output, depends only on the ith channel of the input. So they don't go across channels, and so they don't go across space, but they can um, transfer information across time, in a sense. And uh, that's why they are, in a sense, orthogonal. Uh, they are not spatial filters. And some of these examples include uh, applying a time window, such as um, setting everything to zero that's after a particular time point or before, wavelet transform, and so on. I'll show you a couple of pictures on that. And a special case are spectral filters. Uh, I assure you how. So here's a very simple example of a temporal filter, moving average. Um, so it's defined as the ice channel of, of the uh, output is, is the sum of, of k um, uh, samples of the input, uh, sorry, m samples of the input divided by m. So it's the average. And uh, if you apply this to every sample, you basically get um, a moving average. That's what it's called. It's also called running mean and so on. And if you apply that, you see it basically gives you a smoothing. And so in a sense, it, it only leaves the low frequency components in the signal and it removes high frequency components, fast changes and so on. So in, in a sense, this is actually also a spectral filter. It op operates on the spectrum, you could say. It's a very basic one. Uh, it's, it's very hard to control, um, in a sense, what frequencies it retains and which ones it removes. Um, so, and that takes us to spectral filters. They are, fil they are basically temporal filters that are designed or optimized to have a particular effect on the s s frequency contents of a signal, you can say. And so that requires a little bit of a definition. <laughs> so um, you can define the spectrum of a signal as as a way to represent a signal as a sum of, of n sinusoidal components. So you have a low frequency sinusoid, and you have higher frequency, very high frequency, and so on. So your signal is a sum of, of n components. Each of these components is a sinusoid multiplied by some amplitude, a k. Um, it has, ignore this w k, this should actually be k. Um, <laughs> it has, uh, it's sort of, um, you know, indexed by n, so, uh, you know, it is a sinusoid, really, over time, and it has an offset, that's the phase. And so the, the signal is defined by the coefficients a k and phi k, the phase offsets and the amplitudes. So, um, so you can say a signal can be represented as that. And there is an alternative representation to this, which is a little bit more elegant, uh, which is the so-called Fourier series representation, 
where you say, okay, we rewrite this into um, the signal is the sum of n um, f forms of this type, and this is e to some complex number. This is, you know, j is the imaginary number times, uh, you know, um, k and n, and k is now the frequency in a sense. So again, uh, you know, you have a low frequency one for k equals zero, you have a higher frequency one. And the reason why this works is because of the Euler formula, which says if you take e to a complex um, power, um, that's equivalent to, you know, cosine of, of um, uh, this value plus imaginary number uh, times sine. So you can say uh, in the complex plane, it's sort of, you know, if, if this is a real number and this is imaginary part, it's like an oscillation in this sense. Okay, so this is just a way to rephrase this. It's more elegant in a sense, and uh, that's known as a Fourier series representation. And there's, you know, Fourier transform, which tr takes a signal, transforms it into, into this domain, and um, the inverse Fourier transform, which maps it back. It turns out these are linear transforms, um, because, you know, it's just a sum of some co coefficients times something that is, you know, just part of this function of form here. So the coefficients a, k are now complex valued. They encode basically the amplitude and their magnitude and the phase and the phase angle in a sense. Uh, so very simple story. And um, there's a bunch of examples uh, that are practical. There's uh, in, in BCIs, we call them high pass filters, low pass filters, band pass filters. I'll show you a few examples. The main purpose in, in, in BCI context is just to, if you know something is happening in a particular frequency band, um, they allow you to isolate th these frequency components and suppress all the stuff that you call noise. Um, there is one class that's particularly practical, uh, um, one particular kind of spectra filter, and that's the so-called finite impulse response filter. Um, that is a, uh, it's a linear filter, right? So it's a sum of some coefficients times um, uh, some parts of the signal. So uh, essentially, it's, uh, it, there's a relation to the moving average filter. In the moving average filter, you take all the various previous taps and multiply them by 1 over n. The FIR filter is more flexible in the sense that it allows you to have a variable coefficient for the different taps. And uh, it, the, what this filter does, if you slide this over um, the signal, is a so-called convolution. Um, that's operation, um, linear operation, where you, you know, say you convolve the signal with a kernel. I show you some pictures of this kernel. And so this is sort of the most general linear form that operates on a channel by channel basis. And so it can implement any linear time invariant spectral filter. It doesn't uh, explicitly, the coefficients don't depend on time. And moving average is the case where each of these coefficients is one over n. Now, if you look at certain classes of filters and you plot the coefficients bk, you see they have actually some interesting features. Um, so a low-pass filter, for example, is a rather actually low-frequency ripple, if you will. It, the highest amplitude value is, has, uh, is not the zeroth coefficient. It's somewhere in, it's precisely in the middle. And so if you um, take a signal and multiply, um, you know, all the previous samples by this time series, you will see that um, the sample that's the highest weighted has a delay. Um, and it's half the length of the filter. And so this filter delays the signal like every other, in fact. Here it's more clear because you have the spike. Um, and in general, you can say that the frequency content of the output um, of such a filter is the frequency content of the input multiplied by the spectral representation of this filter. Um, so Low pass filter has only low frequency contents, no high frequency contents. High pass filter is in fact a single spike minus an inverted, you know, low pass filter, if you will. Uh, it's a spike minus this in a sense. Um, so that's why it removes low frequency contents. Um, a band pass filter, okay, uh, just has this particular frequency in it. So there is some nice intuition. And there is one more important part, and that is because BCIs have to be fast and operate in real time, um, what is relevant here is that perhaps you want to minimize the lag of a filter. Instead of, say, half a second, if this is one second, 
um, maybe you want just 20 milliseconds or so. And so there is a way to transform a linear phase filter, um, like this one, to a so-called minimum phase filter, where the highest amplitude is not that many coefficients into the past. Uh, but what they, what they will do is um, different frequencies have different shifts, you know, uh, actually low frequency, it's hard to see, might be um, sort of delayed more than, uh, than a high frequency component in the signal. Whereas here it's, it's symmetric, basically every frequency has a delay of this much time. So that's sort of the trade-off. You can see it, it distorts, in a sense, a signal. But in BCI, you usually don't care as much about distortion as long as the thing works properly. So uh, it's actually very practical to do in MATLAB. So there's a bunch of useful functions in case you care um, to design these filters. There's different kinds of criteria that you can apply. You can say, I design the coefficients such that um, the error that I'm making, um, let's say, is, um, is penalized with, with the square of of the error in a sense. So um, it's a least squares filter design, you, you know, um, has a minimum square error. And that's for FIRLS. Simple matter function in a signal processing true box, you say this is the frequency content that I want, um, and it gives you the coefficients. There's another criterion um, that's called minimax. So you want to say the maximal error that I'm making in any frequency should be minimal, you know. Um, so no, ma no large excursions in a sense. That's uh, FIRPM, Parks McLellan. And you can also actually use the Fourier transform to kind of generate these things. So you could say, I'm starting with a spectral weight, such as, you know, it's um, for low frequencies it's zero, then it, for some middle frequencies goes up to one, and then it goes up to zero for some very high frequencies. And then take the Fourier transform of that. And you might add, um, end up with something like this. But this transform is not optimized, so the coefficients are not, you know, uh, minutely tuned to give you exactly what you wanted. And so um, these things can achieve somewhat more precisely the trade-offs between all the different taps of the filter um, that play into the output of the, of the filter. Um, there's one more thing, and this is you need to decide how long this thing is going to be, how many taps. And uh, for low fre for if you want to affect low-frequency things, you need many taps because you need long waves in a sense. Um, and for high frequency, you need a few. And there's a function to decide that. It's called, um, for, for parse McLaren, it's called FIRPM ORT. ORT stands for order. There's a few more. So uh, for other filter classes, there's also, there's also ways to decide on the order. And um, this function is practical um, to map from linear phase to minimum phase. Uh, it uses something that's called sepstral analysis. We're, we're not going to talk about the details here. So uh, it, it turns out there's, there's a bunch of things in MATLAB that allow us to design these things very easily. There's also other filter classes um, that are relevant in brain computer interfaces, uh, such as so-called spatiotemporal filters. These things basically say apply different frequency weightings for different areas in the brain. Um, you can see there's one filter, um, and it has rather sophisticated design. The, um, basically, they are too complex to really efficiently design them by hand to say, oh, I want, say, a 10 hertz band pass here, and I want a 11 hertz band pass there, or something like that. They're usually also computationally or adaptively designed. And also, um, in many cases, they really have lots of degrees of freedom, so there's lots of numbers involved. And that means you need lots of data, in a sense, to fit and determine these numbers, uh, or lots of knowledge. So they can be a little bit hard to design. Um, and one important class, I already touched on that, are the so-called spectral transforms. So they take a, what we call a time domain signal and um, map it into the spectral domain where you, where you say every tap is a coefficient of phase and amplitude, say, as opposed to time. Um, there's some pretty good... Um, Wikipedia pages on that, if you really want to know the details. <laughs> it's, um, uh, but actually, it's, it's, it's relatively simple, since it's just a linear transform. And uh, then there's also rate-changing filters, such as uh, resampling is an example, 
which take, say, high rate signals and turn them into low rate signals, which allows you to do more efficient processing and so on. And uh, that's basically uh, the end of this very brief tour through various kinds of BCI relevant filter classes.